Welcome back to another UFC fight prediction video. In this video, I'll be predicting the prelim fights for UFC on ESPN3 in Ganu versus Dos Santos. So without further ado, let's get into these prelim fights. Let's get into this first fight on the card. So in our first fight, we have a light heavyweight bout, Daquan Townsend versus Daucha Lungi Abula. I believe that's how you say his name. That's as close as I'm going to get at this moment. So Townsend's coming on short notice. I think his record is like 15 and 7, 6'3", 6 6'4". 6 Lungiaba is like 6 feet tall, 5'11", 5'10". So he's going to have a good bit of height on him. But that's really about it. Lungiaba, I believe, is undefeated or close enough to it. Yeah, I think he only has one loss, I believe. Only one loss. So he has a solid record. I think only lost with submission. Townsend has a couple losses by submission. But overall, just to get to the point, Townsend's coming in a little bit too short. Notice, hasn't really fought the best competition overall. More of a kind of lower tier competition. And yeah, that's about it. Really no real solid competition. And Lungiaba, I think... Overall has better skills than Townsend. Like, and he's going to have more time to train. He's the better grappler. Has that judo background. He's very good at those takedowns from the clinch. Very good at those little trips and stuff. And on top, he has solid ground to pound. And I think overall he's just a better fighter. I think Townsend's main advantage is if, is if he's able to use that reach. And I think he's not going to have enough time to fully prepare to train for Lugiaba. And even for full camp, I think Lugiaba is just a much better, much more common fighter, much more um, refined fighter. I think he's going to... More so I have his way, get on the inside, land some big shots, go for takedowns, and then get some control on the top. Then eventually he finishes him in the second round, for maybe first with some ground and pound, and sets up submission and gets it. So in this fight, I got Dolce Lugiaba via second round submission. Now to our next fight we have in the heavyweight division, Maurice Green versus Junior Albini. So look at this fight. You got Maurice Green, who's about six foot seven, six six something. He's real tall. And we got Albini, who's about six foot two, six foot three, kind of around that height. So uh, Green's gonna have the height. He's gonna have the reach. I think overall Albini's the better fighter, like as far as this experience wise and what he presents. But style wise, I think it favors Green because Albini, though he has the power, though he's overall the better striker, and though he may be able to win in this area and that area. I just think he's not that much of a pressing fighter. He's not. He might pressure you and throw heavy shots, but he's not gonna throw. A lot of value, like maybe what's that one guy that Maurice Green for? I'm not gonna say his name, but the guy that he most recently beat and he lost to prior, but he just avenged that loss in a very close fashion. Just as he lost in a very close fashion years ago, or not too long, right? Really, like two years ago, but whatever the case is. What I see in Green is that it's a lot of striking flaws, a lot of defensive flaws, but they more so come out when people pressure him and throw a lot of value, which makes him make these mistakes because he can't deal with that pressure and that consistency and constantly being in his face. And Albini, he will pressure you, but he's not the guy that's going to throw two and three and four strikes and just kind of constantly be in your face and throw anything and make you have to react. He's going to throw maybe one big kick at a time, one big punch at a time. He hits hard, gonna, you're going to feel it, but he's not going to be in your face throwing a lot of strikes. And I think with that type of style, Green is going to outvalue him and throw more value than him. He's going to be able to fight and use that reach and that range. I think as far as offensively with his submissions, I think he's much more effective than Albini is. So I think even off his back, he might be able to tackle some submissions if Albini goes for a takedown. Now, Albini really doesn't have that grappling cardio that he needs. He might go for one takedown. And if you get up, he really can't go for another one. He's not going to be that active on top. He more so, the best he can do is take you down and hope to lay on you. If you're active off your back, you're most likely going to get back to your feet or be, have some success off your back because he's not going to be really shutting down any transitions. He's not really going to be transitioning himself or really landing any ground pound. The best he can do is take you down and lay on you with his grappling. No, so he really is a striker that has a little bit of basic grappling, like basic level grappling. So on the feet, I really think this fight going to play on the feet. Albini's not going to be doing enough. He's going to be doing hard, but he's not going to be doing enough volume, which is going to allow Green to strike him, outland him, having that reach, having that range, and also having a striking background as well. So really, you know, that comes down to the volume of Green and the lack of grappling on Albini's side. So in this fight, I got Maurice Green via decision. Now to our next fight, we have in the women's strawweight division, Emily Whitmire versus Amanda Reba. So to get to the point of this fight, Emily Whitmire is a solid fighter. I'm not saying she's a stud just yet. Amanda Reba is a good fighter enough to get in the UFC, but really not all that high caliber or really not much, not much to note about her right now. Like when she was coming off a win over not that impressive a win, or at least that not that impressive of a name. And then prior to that, she lost to a chick who's in the UFC and like 0-2 or 0-3 in the UFC. Hasn't fought in about two or three years now, with like since 2016, because she tested positive. So she already wasn't a stellar fighter. Now she's been inactive for three years, and she won't have her PEDs that were helping her to be even what she was, which was not that fantastic. And again, me, I mean, Emily Whitmire is improving and constantly been working. She's been active. She's been looking good. I'm not saying she's no super stud, but she showed um, like solid grappling, solid striking. She's a well-rounded fighter, put her game plan together very well. 
And she, like I said, she's been active. And I think she's the more solid fighter. And plus, she's been the active fighter. So I think Emily Whitmire will have her way with Amanda Rebus in this fight. And I think she submits her in the first round. So in this fight, I got Emily Whitmire via first round submission. Now to our next fight, we have in the lightweight division, Jared Gordon versus Dan Moret. So look at this fight. Jared Gordon has pretty much every advantage in this fight. Dan Moret pretty much just has maybe the physically like longer reach, longer, taller. I think about three inches taller. Maybe have about a six inch reach advantage or something like that. But Jared Gordon... In this fight, he's not dealing with maybe a a fighter like in his was his debut in the UFC on short notice. He fought a fighter that was just much more experienced, a real high level, dangerous fighter, and got beat pretty much everywhere. But he did put on a good effort. Then the next fight, he fought another solid fighter with a little bit more experience, but he was winning that fight up until he got caught and finished. So when you look at the stats, Jared Gordon does way more volume than Moret, like almost doubles him up in volume, doubles him up in strikes landed, doubles him up in takedown attempts, and take takedown secure. So he does a much a higher work rate than fighting. He much like I would say overall he's just a much better fighter outside of some physical features. And Moretz doesn't have that knockout power, but I think he only has one knockout in like twenty or thirty fights. So this kind of favors Gordon in a way that he can outwork him and not really worry about the knockout threat. He's gonna have to respect him for sure. And Moret is a gritty fighter, but Gordon is also gritty fighting. He's the grittier your fighter, he's the harder work and I think he'll outwork um Moret and not really worry too much about getting finished by anything. I think Pretty much this fight comes down to who's the harder worker and that Gordon is the harder worker. So in this fight, I got Jared Gordon via decision. Now to our next fight, we have in the featherweight division, Jordan Griffin versus Vince Murdoch. So look at this fight. Jordan I mean, Griffin came in the UFC. I think he only has one fight. He has a loss to Dan E, who is looking absolutely phenomenal. So that's a, a real, not the, the worst loss to have at this moment with, with um, Dan E. Gay looking so good and so sharp right now. And he gave him pretty much his hardest fight out of the people that um Danny Gay has beat and then look at Vince Murdoch versus G Griffin I only see really any advantage for Murdoch I think Griffin is the more experienced fighter he has the UFC experience had experience in some top some notable organizations outside of UFC Griffin will have I think a three or four inch height advantage and a good significant reach advantage he does more value he's more effective more experienced and more dangerous and I think it's too short of a notice for Murdoch he only have no advantage and he's coming on short notice the only thing advantage he really has is that maybe Griffin as well doesn't have too much time to prepare to prepare for him. But I think overall, Griffin is the better striker, the better grappling. Just all around better than Murdoch. And it's not enough time for Murdoch to make a judgment. So I think Jordan Griffin just dominates him most of this fight. And I think he stops him late in this fight in the third round. So in this fight, I have Jordan Griffin via third round TKO. Now on to our cold prelim headliner we have in the light heavyweight division, Eric Anders versus Vinic Vinicius Moreira. So looking at this fight, Vinicius Moreira, like what I saw when he first came to UFC, like going to the contender series, and then his loss, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, basically what I've seen in him, and I haven't seen anything adjust yet because I'm not like I'm watching his training camps on beside him. But what I see him is a guy who's maybe not the world's best jiu-jitsu practitioner, but he's very solid as far as MMA goes. He's a solid grappler. Once he gets on the ground, he just moves so naturally, like he's swimming on the ground. That's what his element. His elements on the ground, and if he gets you there, he's a very dangerous fighter. On the feet, he's kind of sloppy. He looks very amateurish. He did try to improve it here and there, but still his striking was very amateur. His defense, not the best. Chin, not the best. Punch, don't really, he doesn't really know how to put his power on his punch like he needs. So, so I'm saying, very amateur striking. So you could keep him on the feet. You got good enough takedown defense. And you got some power, got some striking. You pretty much can destroy him at this point. His takedown offense is really kind of subpar. So subpar takedown defense. So he's kind of like an old school jiu-jitsu guy. Subpar takedown defense. But if he can't manage to get you down, he's a monster. But going against Eric Enders, who's an experienced fighter with good takedown defense, good hips. In striking, solid enough striking, in the power. It kind of goes just in the same fight with Minifield. He's going against a guy that he really can't take down and who has much better striking than him in the power and accuracy to put the punches on him. I think Eric Andrew keeps his fight on the feet, lands those big shots, and puts him away, and I think it's in the first round. So in this fight, I have Eric Anders via first round TKL. Now to our prelim headliner we have in the Bantamweight division, Ricardo Ramos versus Journey Newsom. So... This is get the point with Journey Newsom. He's a solid athletic fighter, kind of on the short side. Well, at least compared to Ramos, I think he's about 5'7", and Ramos about 5'11". 5'7", really not short for the weight class, but Ramos is kind of tall for the weight class. Matter of fact, Newsom might be shorter than what I'm saying he is. I'm not even going to look it up. But I know he, he looked very short and compact. Maybe he's fighting taller guys or something, but he's kind of like a short, athletic, little explosive type of guy. But experience is certainly not there. I think... He certainly can have a high ceiling, but Ricardo Ramos is a fighter that's already shown those improvements. He's already been in the UFC for, I think, what, two or three years now? So he has that experience, and he has that skills, and he had that talent and potential, and he's actually been building on it at the highest level. Ricardo Ramos striking certainly has not went up leaps and bounds, despite his last loss. His striking has shown leaps and bounds. He's always been a solid grappler. 
So in this fight, I really think he can just exploit that height advantage. Newsom will be dangerous early with his explosiveness, but being the fact that he's on short camp, that explosiveness, he can't use it as much because he's going, like I said, when you don't really train, the even when you train and you're an explosive type athlete, you're, you can easily gas out, especially now that you're on a short note. It's going against an experienced fighter who's going to try to take advantage of that. I think that's what Roma, I mean, yeah, what Ramos is going to try to do. He's going to try to make him burn himself out early, given that short camp and given his style and his build, use his range, maximize that range, and just kind of drown him. And maybe that first round be competitive, second round somewhat competitive, and start to wear on him, drain him, maybe get him down, take his back, put the weight on him, and start to slip that choke under his neck. I think it happens in the third round early. I think Ramos gets him out of there with with a submission. So in this fight, I got Ricardo Ramos via third round submission. And that concludes my fight predictions for the prelims of UFC on ESPN3 and Ganu versus Dos Santos. And as always, thanks for watching.